uh, and I, did, I thought I would just talk a little bit about it because it's so crucial. Uh, five times in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus calls his disciples and he makes a statement, oh, you have little faith. Okay? He doesn't say no faith. <laughs> he doesn't say, oh, you have no faith. Uh, but he, he, and I want us to look in Matthew where this occurs and why this is so significant. And as I've been reading through and looking at uh, the Gospel of Matthew, it occurs to me that there are at least four minor characters in the book of Matthew that are set up as examples of individuals with great faith that is sort of over and against the disciples who are identified as those who have little faith. And, and as I was looking at it again this morning, uh, in fact, I wrote down the question, I thought, I wonder why Jesus, and let's, let's just talk about the four examples that we'll look at. Uh, there's the uh, centurion, there's the Syrophoenician woman, uh, then there are a couple other examples. But what the question that was raised in my mind, I wonder why Jesus didn't say, okay, let me pick out four disciples that are not really getting it. Uh, I'm going to move you guys aside, and I'm going to let these other four come in and take your place. He doesn't do that. Um, you get the impression that what Jesus wants is for the 12 that he has chosen uh, to wake up with their awareness of what faith is all about. Because in every occasion... In the Gospel of Matthew where he has to work with them and try to help them understand what's going on, uh, he, he knows that they don't have the kind of faith he's really looking for yet. And yet he stays with them for over three years, discipling them. Here's what's interesting. Jesus has to disciple his disciples. And, and I suspect, and it'd be neat if we could have had this in, in some of the later literature, uh, but you take someone like Peter and others. I would suspect that in their early teaching and preaching, once the church began, they could look back and they could see specific occasions and events and moments where, as of course, as they've gotten older and they're maturing as a disciple, like, oh, this is what Jesus was trying to do back then. And so you, you know that the New Testament presents this whole thing of discipleship as a long, continuous growth. And my suspicion is, all of us sitting here this morning in this class, we've had long periods of continuous growth, but you're still here because you don't take that growth for granted and you want to continue to perceive yourself as growing spiritually. Because if you don't continue to think in that mode of not growing, then you become stale, stagnant, uh, your faith becomes ineffective, and a lot of other things you could say about that. So this is just to kind of set the background for understanding why uh, this concept of little faith is so crucial in Matthew. Uh, the only other gospel writer that uses that phrase is Luke. He uses it one time. And it's in the same parallel event that you find in Matthew. Um, so this is such an important concept in the Gospel of Matthew about the ministry of Jesus. So as we begin, uh, I want to uh, point out that the word little faith literally is little faith ones. Oh, you of little faith. It takes place in five passages in Matthew where Jesus asks some questions. And it's when his disciples face specific situations. And let me list them for you. And we could have a whole lesson just on this. But they face fear. They face anxiety. They face affliction. They face uncertainty. And they face desperation. Those five things. And as I was looking at those five things, I thought, wow, probably each one of us at a certain level, we experience all five of those in our Christian life, don't we? And let me, let me say them again. Fear. Think of the fears that we have to deal with all the time. 
uh, most of the time we sort of feel like we keep them at bay. You know, they're, they're not overwhelming. Every now and then for most of us, uh, a fear of something becomes overwhelming. Uh, probably from a counseling perspective, the word phobia, which is the Greek word for fear, gets used when an individual can't in a healthy way deal with the fear that they've got. It becomes so overwhelming that it really just ruins their life and takes over. Uh, so, I, and I would say then that as we live in this world as human beings, there are fears that crop up. Uh, I think we have to be careful. I don't like it when I hear blanket statements. People will say, okay, if you're the Christian you ought to be, you shouldn't fear anything. I'm like, really? What planet did you come from? <laughs> Maybe they came from the planet of no fear, so I don't know where that is. Uh, but in following Jesus as a disciple, we recognize that he is a, how can I say this? He is the resource of the power of God to help us deal with those fears. We don't deny them. We don't pretend that they don't exist because they're there. And here's another thing, and boy, you know this, at every age of our season of life, it, it brings up new things to be anxious over and to be afraid about. The things I fear now are not what I feared when I was in my 20s and 30s. Whole different set. And I think that's true for all of us. We, we sort of fear different things. Uh, so in the Christian life, we need to be aware that if we experience fear, it doesn't mean we don't have any faith. It may not even mean that we have little faith. It, what it may mean is at that moment, we have an opportunity to grab a hold of Jesus and help us deal with it, okay? Now, the other uh, second one that I listed was affliction. Oh no, anxiety, let's do anxiety. Uh, in this chapter, uh, Matthew 6, this whole thing on do not worry. Anxiety and worry, well again, we all kind of struggle with that. But have you ever heard someone uh, use the expression, I worried myself sick? <laughs> have you ever heard that expression? So if you worry yourself sick, what's happened is you've let that anxiety and that worry uh, so overwhelm you that, that you don't really know there are other options out there for you. Uh, so being a Christian means that, again, with Jesus as my Lord, and I'm, I'm trying to be a disciple here, uh, I don't pretend that there aren't things that I worry about, and I have, I'm a little bit anxious and struggle with, but I know that as a disciple, when those things come up, again, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are my resources to help me deal with that, okay? Now, the third one is affliction. And boy, this one, this is the one I think that probably gets most of us. If, if you listen carefully, uh, I'm always amazed on Sunday morning when we have, uh, and it's usually the, the final prayer, not always, but think of how much of our prayers in congregational assembly uh, often are intercessory prayers, and we have so many references to people that are afflicted with who knows what. Okay. So being a disciple of Jesus, again, you don't deny the afflictions, but you know that the power to deal with it is through God and Christ in the Spirit. Now here's what's interesting. As a disciple, in prayer, we go to God for him to help us with our afflictions, whatever they are. I wish I could stand up here this morning and tell you that there's a magic formula that every time you prayed for an affliction, if you prayed it just right, God would get rid of it. Now, if I were to say that, you would, you would, <laughs> you would think that I lost my mind because you know better than that. Sometimes the Lord will answer our prayers in relationship to being relieved of afflictions. Sometimes he doesn't. And I don't know why. It's just the journey of faith. That God gave Paul when Paul prayed for his 
affliction to be released and God's reminded him and he reminds us that my grace is sufficient for you. And we need to remember that, that God, whatever that we deal with, and we're all afflicted, and we will continue to be afflicted all the rest of our lives. We all exactly. have to deal with all these things all of our lives. It may not be the same as what it had been in the past, but it's going to crop up it will. all through our lives. And our faith, sometimes our faith will be stronger, sometimes it will be lower, and it's an up and down process. It, oh, wow. It's a growing process all the way through life. You sound like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> that was that was great. Did y'all get to hear that? That was great. Judy, I think you've nailed it. Uh, there's never going to be a time when we don't face affliction. It seems like at times we may have a breathing space. And we're like, okay. Uh, like, for example, if you go up to someone and say, how's your family doing? You're like, everybody's well. Nothing bad has happened, and we're thankful. You know, so we go through those periods where it doesn't look like we have a lot of affliction. And then there's, we, oh, we grappled with this a little bit on our Thursday night class, uh, small group. Because Christian writers through the centuries notice this. And it, it's struggling with the question, why do some Christians seem to have more affliction than others? I don't know the answer to that one. That's a tough one. Um, that's putting aside afflictions or problems or issues. Uh, it's part of it. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, that, that's true too. Uh, and then of course, when people experience things as a direct consequence of some bad choices they've made, that's a whole different issue too. Okay, but this whole thing of affliction, uh, as Judy said, I, I, I always like to think in terms of the Apostle Paul with his metaphor of thorn in the flesh. Um, it's so funny if you, if you do the reading on it, through the centuries people have proposed all sorts of things about that thorn in the flesh. I have a list, I was trying to remember, I think I've had a list of where the, uh, I've discovered 15 different proposals through the years of what that thorn in the flesh was. Uh, so people have had all kinds of ideas. Uh, let me, let me just sort of paint a picture with this for a second, because I think this is why Paul uses that metaphor. As you know, if you ever get a thorn uh, in your hand or wherever, uh, it's painful. It may be that the Apostle Paul used this metaphor, thorn in the flesh, because he was dealing with something that was physically painful. That's an option, of course. What, even, what also is interesting with the example of thorn in the flesh is many times a thorn if you know if it goes in deep enough it stays there for a while and it's irritating and you can't get it out and so Paul may have also been dealing with something thorn in the flesh that was there and he couldn't get rid of it and that made it very difficult uh, another reason that I think that he uses thorn in the flesh is he, it was something that he perceived limited his ministry. Uh, he felt like it got in the way. And that's why after he prays three times for the Lord to relieve him of that thorn in the flesh, uh, God says, no, actually it's going to enable me to work more through your weakness. And so Paul has to have this and, and in 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about this whole change of mindset. Therefore, most gladly will I accept my weaknesses so that through that the power of God may be seen. So, so on the one hand, to begin with, Paul couldn't stand his thorn in the flesh. Prayed three times for God to get rid of it. But then the Lord had a bigger picture in mind. And when the light bulbs came on for Paul... Like, okay, well, I'll gladly accept it now because I know through that God's going to work through me. And that's a whole different way of looking at affliction in ministry, isn't it? In the sense that we live in a culture where we have accepted, almost without critique, that God's strength and his kingdom is seen through my strength. That's just the way we think. It's just the way we look at stuff. Paul says, no, actually it's the other way around. 
the power of God works through my weakness. Really? And that's part of, and this is, this is a great thing to think about too, there are probably 10 to 12 significant paradoxes in the New Testament about the Christian faith. And some of that is why people don't get the Christian faith, because there's such paradoxes. And here's one of them, that through our weakness, the power of God is seen. Oh. And I suspect that it takes a lifetime of Christian living with afflictions that we can't get rid of, like Paul, and we find the light bulbs finally come on, and then we understand. Oh, so God's now able to work through me because it's not all about me and what I can accomplish. That's such a neat way of thinking about that. And that's the model that Paul proposes. Okay? And then we talk about uncertainty. And that uncertainty can be toward a lot of things. It can be toward the future. Uh, uncertainty about how things are going to turn out. They go a different direction than what you anticipated. Uh, uncertainty about others around you that you thought were supposed to be helping you. Uh, think of all the different ways in which we as disciples of Christ, we face uncertainties. And Jesus' disciples sort of let those uncertainties just kind of undo them. And Jesus knew that. And then desperation. Uh, sometimes people become desperate. It doesn't look like things are going to change so you say or do something in a situation you otherwise wouldn't do. And it's not from a stance of faith, it's from a stance of desperation. And maybe at points in your life you have found yourself uh, at a moment of desperation. And that's not a good feeling. And yet what Jesus is going to challenge with discipleship is, even in those moments of desperation, look to God, look to Christ, look to the Spirit. That's the direction you need to turn because too often in moments of desperation, what we fall back on is what we think we know and what we think will work. And that's all. And really for the, for the disciple of Christ, uh, the picture is much bigger than that. Now, when Jesus uses this expression, oh, you of little faith, uh, it functions as Jesus' reproach against his disciples, because fundamentally, they don't have any confidence in what God and Jesus can do for them. In the passages where, oh, you of little faith occurs, we've, we've looked at Matthew 6.30, look at Matthew 8.26. Uh, this is where Jesus calms the storm. They say, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Now, I've often thought, when you think about this, if you were in the shoes, if I were in the shoes of the disciples, and we're in a boat, and the, and the water's sweeping over the side of that boat, uh, I think they're <laughs> making an appropriate response. Lord, save us, we're going to drown. I think I would have said the same thing. Jesus uses this as a teaching moment, a golden teaching moment, because he rebukes the wind and the waves. And this is interesting. And I don't want to get too far off in this, but this idea of rebuke is significant in the Gospels. Jesus has the power to rebuke demons and storms. And in every one of those cases where Jesus does the rebuking, and even his disciples, they, they become the, uh, the focus sometimes of his rebuking. In every case, there is a lesson to be learned. And when these men in the boat saw this, they were amazed. Can you imagine if you're, that you were in their shoes and all of a sudden this storm... Waves over the boat, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the winds and the waves. What we don't have here is something that I wish that we did. 
I wonder what Jesus said when he rebuked the winds and the waves. What did he say? Because rebuking means you use words. Did he come up beside the boat and say, okay, you guys, stop it. <laughs> or what, what did Jesus say? Uh, I am sure that whatever he said, it was designed to catch the disciples' attention because they were amazed by it. I don't know. I've often wondered what was the words that he said when he rebuked the winds and the waves. That really kind of gets your creative mind going, doesn't it? Uh, you don't know what it is, but it was, uh, I'm sure that it wasn't long and explanatory. It was just probably very short, to the point, and it, and it got their attention and it got the results of the lake being calm. They're like, wow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that may have been what he said there. Peace, be still. Short, to the point. And those guys seeing that, whoa. You know, I mean, it didn't, it, it didn't take a rocket scientist to make that connection between the effect and peace be still on the other occasion as it's recorded. Yes? You is the, is the addition of the opposite of what is taking place. The opposite, okay, yeah. All right. If you're doing something and you're rebuked, it means that what you're doing is the opposite of what should exist. Yeah. And if the storms are raging, the comment, peace be still, it is that rebuke. It is, yeah. That's, that's, that's a neat insight for the nature of, of why even a rebuke is said. Uh -huh. Because Jesus is desiring the opposite effect even in the lives of his disciples. Now, when we see these characters, these disciples in Matthew uh, facing issues like worries about food and fear of death, either by drowning or because of a storm, uh, it's interesting that from the way Matthew records it, these disciples, you would think this, that it would have such an impact on them that when Jesus asked the question, they see different results. They would have said, okay, I'm going to be a disciple now with strong faith. Don't worry about it. But, yes. Years ago when I first began to teach Bible classes, I taught a class of third grade girls. And uh, I would always sing with them. We'd sing a song. And so one Sunday I asked them what they wanted to sing. And one of the little girls said, please be still. Peace be still. Yeah, we. So we've, that's a child's eyes was seeing that God, that Jesus was saying to the wind and the waves, "Please be still." Please be still. Peace <laughs> be still. Yeah, isn't that neat? That's so neat. It, it's uh, it's through the lens of childlike faith. I, I love that. Constantly in Matthew, the disciples don't understand Jesus. Uh, the little faith that they have is based on their lack of confidence. Uh, in each setting, in Matthew, in these passages, God or Jesus are, are offered as providing assistance. Um, even, even in chapter 8 and verse 24, where Jesus is originally sleeping, he's still with his disciples, he's still in control, but they don't know that. So there's a lot that they don't understand and they're having to work through. Look at Matthew 14, 31. This is where Jesus walks on the water. Interesting things happen on the water. Uh, they're out in the boat. Uh, they, they see Jesus goes out to them during the fourth watch of the night and he's walking on the lake and when the disciples see him, uh, they're terrified. And their res immediate response is, it's a ghost and they cry out in fear. So their immediate response, that's the only way they can sort of assess something. It's got to be a ghost. But Jesus said, take courage in his eye, don't be afraid. Uh, there have been a lot of commentators on the Gospel of Matthew that would say this, 
these words spoken by Jesus at this moment, it gives us an insight into what Jesus is offering anyone who becomes his disciple, no matter the situation. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now, there's something to be said for following someone that can tell you that. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? But you see, that's not enough for Peter. <laughs> Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water. Jesus didn't say, now, Peter, you know you can't do that. Peter, you don't know what you're asking. So Jesus, Jesus says, come. <laughs> so Peter got down of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind... He was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, what's interesting, many people pointed this out. Apparently, the way the narrative is laid out here, as long as Peter was looking at Jesus, he was fine. But look at what happened. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And, of course, the assumption is the wind whipping up the waves, too. So Peter looks around and he's like, what am I doing? He, he had that idea float through. What am I doing? I'm out here walking. And, and as a result of that, he sinks. And immediately, Jesus reached his hand and caught him. There is, somebody sent this to me. There is a picture painted by an artist. And I don't think it's quite accurate because in my perception, I don't think Peter went down under the water before Jesus grabbed him. He may have, but I've always thought he grabbed him before he went completely under. But there, someone has painted a picture that shows the per that Peter's under the water, and you know how reality looks through water, and, and you see the wavy hand of Jesus reaching down toward the top of the surface of the water to get him. Maybe that's the way it was, I don't know, but I just that kind of startled me. I was like, oh, what if that's what Peter saw when Jesus was reaching out to him? And to sink, meaning that it was a slow process. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it, yes, it was a process, and the person walking on the water is just going to look cool. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're going to go down like a rock. That's exactly right. And beginning to sink, he cried out. Peter probably doesn't know how to swim. Either, yeah. And and another thing is, I've, I wonder how far away from the boat he got. See, that's another, we don't know how far away he was from the boat. But it says when they climbed back in the boat, the wind died down. Yeah, it says he, he came toward Jesus as he walked, so we don't know. He climbs into the boat, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Do you remember who else? says truly this must be the son of God. Yes. The, the Roman centurion at the cross. Truly you are the son of God. Uh, it is interesting that in this episode. Let, let me see where he says it. Uh, and this is actually before they, they worshipped him. And he's saying it to Peter. You of little faith. Why did you doubt? And their response is that they worshiped and they said, truly you are the son of God. Here's the question that Matthew raises for each of us. What, what, what did it take and what will it take for individuals to come to that point of confession? Truly you are the son of God. That's our Christian confession. Uh, the centurion was able to say that at the cross as Jesus was dying. He was working through some things. He knew something was different. <laughs> you know, I've always, I've always given Peter a little bit of latitude here because he's the only one that got out of the boat. You're right. You know, so we think, well, poor Peter, at least he stepped out, went toward Jesus. And, and guess what this does? See, this is a, a, a moment in the story and a visual thing for us that shows demonstration of a little bit of faith, doesn't it? Jesus doesn't say he didn't have any faith. 
Peter had a little bit because he got out of the boat. He said, Lord, if it's you, let me walk to you. That amazes me. Because for me, at least from my perspective, that would take a whole lot of faith to say that. Okay? Just to say that. Well, that's pretty cool. I'd like to do that. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, wasn't, he probably really wasn't thinking. He may not have been. But he saw, yeah, you know, how yeah. was. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe it was a strong, impetuous response. And Jesus does not say this to the ones that stayed in the boat. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh, he doesn't say that. What, what's interesting is those in the boat, when they saw all of this, though, look at their response. They worshiped him. And I'm trying to remember, I've got to go back. I think the word here for worship is, is the word to prostrate yourself down in front of Jesus. I think that's the word. Uh, their amazement and their response to truly this is the Son of God. Wow. And remember we said at the outset, as Matthew is writing this whole story about who Jesus is, there are going to be places in the Gospel of Matthew where some people get it. Now, not in, in full comprehension, but the doors are open. And they're like, oh, and they get this peek into who Jesus really is. Uh, and think about this. And I know you've experienced this in your own Christian life. When things happen in your life, all of a sudden, because of your response to them and you're convinced of how you've seen God help you in, in facing certain things, you have these light bulbs of faith, intuition pop on. You're like, oh, I see it now in a way I never did before. See, that's faith growing. That's what discipleship is all about. Making sure that you're open to those golden moments of growing a faith. When you rely on God and Jesus and the Spirit, and all of a sudden you have this insight, oh, that's what's going on, wow. And, and it becomes almost like a worshipful moment in response to God's participation right then kind of a, a fascinating part of the Christian journey. Oh, our time is up. Um, let's look at Matthew 16, 8, and then we'll, we'll close. Uh, this is interesting because uh, when the disciples went across the lake and they forgot to take bread, Jesus said, be careful, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, they didn't have a clue again what he's talking about. They thought uh, he's, he's talking something about them. But what he really means is it's because we didn't bring any bread. So they're used, they're used to Jesus talking in stories and parables. Uh, so they think they understand it, but they've missed the point. And so Jesus is aware of their discussion. Oh, you of little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand that's such a significant question on his part because he knows that there's so many times, and it's still this way, there are times they just don't get it. Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood. He wasn't talking about them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is one of the places that they finally got it. He had, he had to go into more detail, but thought, oh, okay, that's what he's talking about. Uh, but Jesus wants them to be aware of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, it's the very thing that Jesus has conflict with in all of the uh, book of Matthew. But at the same time, uh, he says, you have little faith because at that moment, you're keeping things on just a physical level. You're not thinking about what I'm really talking about. And so Jesus sort of reproaches them for that. Uh, let me just close with one more comment. In these five places in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, it's not just a rebuke or a reproach. The flip side of it is, and if we went into more detail, we could see this, it's also an invitation to deeper discipleship. That's what Jesus is really after. And this is what you said, Bill, that in the beginning, there's the rebuke, 
It's not the way things ought to be. What Jesus is really after is the opposite. It is a, a deeper understanding and an invitation to real discipleship. So, well, thank you all for being here this morning.